Hi folks, HR Funk here, with part three in my series on the FN FAL rifle, a rifle which will once again be represented by the DS Arms SA-58 that I'm holding here. And in this video, I'm going to take a look at some of the history of the FAL. Now, some of you may recall that in the recent videos in this series, I've mentioned that I'm not really familiar with the FAL. I'm new to the rifle. In fact, the shots that I fired in my last video were the first that I have ever fired out of an FAL pattern rifle. Even so, there is a chapter of the history of the FAL with which I am at least somewhat acquainted, and that took place during the 1950s when this rifle was vying to become the official battle rifle of the U.S. military. And in this video, I'm going to tell you just how close it came to achieving that goal. I'll also tell you how it got derailed at the last minute. Now, if you're someone who is looking at this video, hoping to see lots of rounds being fired and steel targets ringing and all that, you may as well just go ahead and punch out right now because this is going to be more of me talking about the history of this rifle and a segment of the U.S. military history that is still debated to this day. It's one of those topics that just never seems to go away and people will still sit around and chew over exactly what happened and why this rifle was not selected and why maybe it should have been selected. So that's what I'm going to be looking at. And to all you YouTube monitors out there, this is a video about history not a video about firearms. Anyway, let's get right to it and we're going to take a look first at the rifle that this was trying to replace. In 1936, the U.S. military officially adopted the John C. Guerin designed M1 as the official battle rifle for U.S. troops. Even so, by the time the U.S. entered World War II, the M1 was still not being issued to all the members of the U.S. military, and the fact that literally millions more Americans were coming into service at that time meant that it was going to take even longer for everyone to get their own M1. Even so, the M1 rifle went on to serve with distinction during World War II, and it's an odd historical irony that due to small arms developments that took place during World War II, the M1 design was really rendered obsolescent during the course of the very conflict in which it helped to achieve victory. Even so, by war's end, the U.S. military was already looking to replace, or at very least significantly modify, the M1 design. Let's take a look at some of the reasons why. I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that one of the first complaints leveled against the M1 rifle was that it is big and heavy. Here on my scale, with nothing but a sling attached, my M1 is coming in at just over 10 and a half pounds, and if I add an end block clip and eight rounds of ammunition, that brings it up to almost 11 pounds, and I should probably point out that this is dummy ammunition, so there is no powder in these cartridges. If there were, the weight would probably be just a little bit more than 11 pounds. When U.S. troops were looking at the M1 and thinking about some of the other firearms developed during World War II, like the Sturmgewehr developed by the Germans. With that platform, they had a smaller, lighter weapon that held far more rounds of ammunition, but still allowed the troops to move and maneuver more easily. That being the case, it's not difficult to see why individual soldiers, Marines, sailors, etc., would have wanted a smaller and lighter platform of their own to be able to use in future conflicts. Another thing that came to be frowned upon was the M1's internal eight round clip fed magazine. As already noted, this limited the rifle's capacity to eight cartridges, and really there was no easy way to increase the capacity while maintaining that internal magazine. So the military wanted to change this design to something that would accept a detachable box magazine that could hold more cartridges and also could still be rapidly switched out when it was empty. As a footnote, it's interesting to recognize that there were efforts on the part of armorers in the field during World War II to address some of these handling and weight issues and also increase the capacity of the M1. Even so, by war's end, it was just the desire of the military to replace this design with something new and improved. This all led to a decade and a half odyssey, the goal of which was to replace the M1. But not just the official battle rifle was ultimately intended for replacement, but the U.S. really wanted to replace all small arms in use at that time, everything from handguns to battle rifles to submachine guns to the BAR were all going to be replaced, or at least this was the idea, to replace all of those weapon systems with a single weapon system. And I really think that was an overreach from the get-go. Even so, 
To that end, the U.S. developed a new cartridge, and actually the development of that cartridge started back during the 1940s, and culminated with what was called the T-65E3 cartridge, which we know today as the 7.62 millimeter NATO, or in its civilian guise, the 308 Winchester. And the 7.62 NATO cartridge was closer ballistically to the 30-06 cartridge that it was replacing than it was to a true intermediate cartridge on the lines of the 7.92 by 33 millimeter Kurtz developed by the Germans for the STG-44, the Sturmgewehr. So right off the bat, the U.S. was getting off on the wrong foot by using a more powerful cartridge than would have been desirable for the smaller, lighter, easier maneuverable, high capacity weapon that they wanted to use at the beginning, or wanted to develop rather at the beginning. Now, to a degree, I can kind of see this. We had just come out of World War II where the 30-06 had performed phenomenally. It performed a couple of decades earlier than that just as well in World War I, albeit in different rifles. So the idea of continuing with something that was ballistically similar to what had worked so well is understandable, except it worked against the idea of coming up with a true assault rifle, which again was what they wanted to do from the beginning. Had they done that, they might have been able to come up with something a little closer to replacing all those weapon systems that they wanted to eventually replace. Now at this point, some of you may be thinking, hey, HR Funk, I thought this was supposed to be a history of the FNFAL. So far, all you've been doing is talking about the history of the M1 battle rifle. Actually, what I've been doing is setting the stage. As I said, the desire was to replace not only the official battle rifle, but also several other weapon systems with a single platform. And there were a couple of different routes that were explored to achieve that end. One was to modify and improve the design of the M1 rifle itself. The other was to look at a design like the FN FAL that was manufactured by a foreign company to see if it would already meet the requirements that the US military had established. In the late 1940s, Dudenay Sev, as I mentioned in a previous video, was working on the design of this rifle, what became known as the FAL, once again, FAL standing for Fusil Automatique Légère, or Light Automatic Rifle, and I'm probably not pronouncing that well for anyone who actually speaks the language, but I'm doing my best. In any case, the British military was initially interested in the FAL, and they were developing a new battle rifle cartridge of their own, which came to be known as the 280 British, which was actually much closer to a true intermediate rifle cartridge. The British offered the FAL for consideration to the US military, and basically the first thing the US military said was, we need to have that rechambered to accommodate the T-65 cartridge or the 7.62 NATO. When that was done, the FAL design was made somewhat larger and heavier to accommodate that more powerful cartridge, and once again, we can see where the steps taken by the U.S. were contrary to the goal they were trying to achieve. From August through December of 1952, a series of tests were conducted, and several different rifles were evaluated during the course of that testing as possible replacements for the M1, one of which was the T-44, which was a precursor to the rifle that I'm holding here, and also the FN-FAL, Interestingly, the M1 itself was used as a control rifle during that testing, and when the gun smoke settled, the FN FAL was in first place, this rifle was in second place, the M1 came in third place, and the other rifles in the evaluation were lower than the M1 that they were at least trying to replace. This led to further testing of the T-44 rifle and the FN FAL, which took place over the course of the next several years. Now, it's interesting to note that at the end of that testing in 1952, the board tasked with evaluating the results essentially stated that had they been required to recommend a rifle at that time, it would have been the FN FAL, not the T-44. So the FAL not only did better than the T-44, it did significantly better to the point that the board, had they been pressed, would have recommended this rifle at that time and it would be the rifle we know today as the US M14. However, 
As I said, testing was continued with both rifle platforms, and there were a number of similarities between the two rifles. First, they both weighed less than 10 pounds. Both of them were capable of both automatic and semi-automatic fire. Both of them fed from a 20-round detachable box magazine. Both of them were gas-operated, and both of them chambered the T65 or 7.62mm NATO cartridge. Regarding that latter characteristic, specifically both rifles being chambered for the 7.62mm NATO cartridge, I think there's another aspect of that that bears mentioning because I believe it had an impact on the way things went and also had ripple effects into the future, actually decades into the future. And that was the fact that for NATO to adopt the 7.62mm cartridge, there actually had been an agreement that was struck by, at that time, Prime Minister Winston Churchill and, at that time, President Harry Truman, I believe in 1952. And the deal was essentially that if the U.S. military would adopt the FNFAL as the official battle rifle, the remainder of NATO would adopt the 7.62mm cartridge as the official cartridge for the organization. There's really no way to say the U.S. did not ultimately renege on that deal, but by the time the ultimate decision was made adopting the M14, Harry Truman was long out of office, and I'm not sure exactly when Winston Churchill left office as prime minister, but he may well have been out of office too. In any case, as I said, that really played a part in small arms development, small arms use, etc. for decades into the future, and there was more than one person in NATO who wasn't happy with the fact that they had to use the 7.62mm cartridge, especially when only a few years later, in the mid-1960s, the U.S. again changed horses in the middle of a stream and adopted the smaller 5.56mm NATO cartridge. So there was all kinds of political wrangling and maneuvering and one thing and another going on throughout this entire process. And as I said, it did have a bearing on it, and if nothing else, it prolonged things way beyond where they should have been. So by mid-1953, the test board at Fort Benning, Georgia, recommended that the T-44 rifle be dropped from further consideration and only the FNFAL be continued in the testing process. At that point, it was essentially a foregone conclusion that the FAL was going to go on to become the official battle rifle of the U.S. military. But it was decided to keep the T-44 in testing just for use as a control during upcoming Arctic weather testing for the FAL. Essentially, the only reason they kept the T-44 around was to see how much better the FN-FAL was going to perform than the T-44 when they got into the Arctic weather testing. So that's kind of a dubious distinction for the T-44. But the folks who were working on the T-44 at Springfield Armory saw this as one last opportunity to try to improve that rifle to the point that it could actually compete with the FNFAL. So in December of 1953, the latest and most improved version of the T-44 rifle was sent for Arctic weather testing side by side with the FNFAL, which by that time had been designated as the T-48 rifle by the U.S. military. And when that testing was concluded, it was not that the newest and most improved version of the T-44 performed so well as it was the FNFAL, or T-48, performed so poorly during that Arctic testing. The FAL experienced parts breakage. It also had functioning problems. There was more severe recoil experienced by the troops because of some field expedient repairs that FN engineers tried to effect during the course of the testing. And after that testing was concluded, the FAL was just never viewed quite as favorably again by the U.S. military. Not only were the prospects of the T-48, or FNFAL, for replacing the M1 suffering as a result of that lackluster performance during the Arctic weather testing, but also the U.S. was attempting to convert the drawings for the metric FNFAL to imperial or inch drawings that could be used by U.S. manufacturers to actually build the rifle, and that was more problematic than expected. There were also some other issues with trying to actually build this rifle in the United States, and this dragged on for more and more years. Finally, in 1956, the Army stated simply that both the T-48 and the T-44 were acceptable for military service. 
they essentially called it a draw and said it doesn't matter which way you go, either rifle is going to work. So when the final decision on the part of the people responsible for conducting the tests of the rifles intending to replace the M1 was basically, it's a toss up, choose whichever one you want. It's not difficult to see why the selection went in favor of the T-44 rifle. First off, it's about a pound lighter than the T-48 or the FAL. Also, it has fewer parts to make construction and maintenance a little bit easier. And also, and I don't think this can be downplayed, I think this is very significant. In form and function, the T-44 is very similar to the M1 rifle that the troops were already familiar with, meaning that transitioning the troops to the new T-44 was going to be much easier, less time consuming, and less expensive than it otherwise would be. So on May 1st of 1957, the T-44 was selected as the US M14 rifle, and at that time it officially replaced the M1 as the official battle rifle of the United States. So the M14 went on to achieve the rather ignominious distinction of being the US service rifle with the shortest time as the official battle rifle, but even so, several decades later, it rose from its own ashes and was once again pushed into service during the global war on terror. Had the choice been made early on in the 1950s in favor of the FAL, it's interesting to speculate as to how history might have gone differently. When we look at some of the versions of the FAL that are being manufactured by DS Arms today that are much shorter and lighter than this full-size battle rifle, and when we think that could have been conducted by the US in modifying the original battle rifle, especially if a true intermediate rifle cartridge had been selected, would we have ever seen the rise of the M16? Would that be even something that was fielded today by the United States or in its current generation, the M4 carbine? Or would we see troops using something like this only maybe scaled down and a little bit more portable and a little lighter, which is exactly what we've seen happen with the AR platform over the last several decades? There's no way to know that, but it is interesting to think about this period in time of our history and how close this rifle came to becoming, to the point that really everyone thought it was going to be the next battle rifle, and were it not for that one Arctic weather test where it performed poorly, it may well have been the official battle rifle for the United States. In any case, that's the video for today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, as always, make sure you forward those to me. Remember, stop by hrfunk.com and check out all the information there under the product information page, and make sure to check out all of the dis discount codes that go with all those various products listed there. See you next time, folks. And until then, good shooting. Bye-bye.